Good morning, Pennington. My name is Patty, and our scripture reading for this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, reading from the ESV version. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Patty. What a beautiful reading of scripture this morning as we continue into our Hebrews series. This morning, we are looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through chapter 5, verses 14, which is all of chapter 5. Um, we're going to be looking at Jesus as our great high priest, and we're going to be looking at some harsh words that the author says to the church in Hebrews, as well as his encouragement, again, about the character of Jesus. Uh, but before that, I want to talk to you about two things. The first one is just an encouragement. Um, we have launched our small groups officially. This Monday starts our second, well, our third week of small groups. And so if you haven't joined one yet, you still can. Any of our small group leaders would love to see you come out, be a part of community. As well as if you live in an area or your schedule doesn't match up with the small groups we offer, on the small groups part of our website, you can also click the link there to let us know, hey, I have an idea for a small group or there's a need for a small group somewhere else or in another time. So please let us know. We're trying to create community for all of our church body. Second is we are running midweek formation, um, sort of small group adjacent. It is a place where we look at the larger narratives of scripture and then how do we implement that theology by praying through it? What does it mean to pray through the scriptures that we're studying? We just started a new series on the family of God or looking at how God brings beautiful unity in diversity and that Jesus Christ is the only way in the last uh, thousands of years of human history where unity comes without the sacrifice of our individual uniqueness and who we are. The next two weeks we're really going to be excited about. Um, we have guest pastors from Mercer County who are going to be joining us this week. Um, it's Pastor Anthony Gilmer from Central. And the following week is going to be Shana Giacco uh, who's going to be talking about Babel and the diversity God has brought in to the church. So we're really excited every Wednesday we'll be studying that together. Lastly, the whole time I've been talking about small groups and midweek formation, Hebrews and Jesus as a priest, you've just been thinking to yourself, where are the terrible jokes? Well, here you go. Terrible jokes, and I'm not sure I love Maddie throwing shade at me in the announcement video, but... I have a couple jokes. First one, we're going to just center ourselves in Hebrews. We're going to come back to our center point of how does Moses make his coffee? He brews it. I need a little more enthusiasm than that. But I'm not going to have you this week. Next week, bring that enthusiasm. I have a couple more even worse jokes. Who was the smartest person in the Bible? Abraham. He knew a lot. A groan is the appropriate response. Where was Solomon's temple located? On his head. Yeah, Dave, bringing it. How do we know Peter was a rich fisherman? By his net income. All right. Yeah, good, 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 good. As we study Hebrews, um, We've started this little bit of reading these terrible jokes, but it literally has nothing to do with the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written by an anonymous author. We don't know who wrote the letter. Um, what we do know is they are writing to Jewish Christians in the first century who are experiencing persecution. In fact, for many of us, if we don't have a real deep understanding of the Old Testament, Hebrews actually can be a little tricky. Because the author assumes that the readers know a ton about Hebrew history and religion and practice. 
They write things about Moses and about angels and about the law and priests, just assuming we would know those passages. As we are studying Hebrews together, we've given each of you a little Hebrews prayer journal that you can walk through, take notes in, study with. My encouragement to you is, as we study, if you can go back every time we're referencing an Old Testament passage, we may not have time here to study each one because they reference the Old Testament a lot. At home, go back and read that story, read that psalm, read that passage, and fill yourself with the context of what the author of Hebrews is writing. The author is writing to persecuted Jewish Christians. This means Jewish people of the faith who had now become followers of Jesus. They still identified as Jewish, but Jewish now walking under the great rabbi, teacher, and savior, Jesus Christ. And they were being persecuted for that. Persecuted by the Romans because Christian faith was having a financial impact. And so they're now persecuting them. Persecuted by the Jewish community, losing connections to family and the culture they were a part of because they were taking on the identity of Jesus. So a lot of them had, under extreme external pressure, the temptation to just jettison the Jesus part. I'll just go back to being Jewish. The entire letter of Hebrews is an argument why you can't do that, why that just doesn't work. You cannot lose Jesus for anything else. And basically, the author is one thing at a time listing something important, angels, Moses, the law, priests, and saying Jesus is far better than any of this. And as we look at Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 4 and 5, we are entering into five chapters in the letter specifically around priesthood and arguing about Jesus being the great high priest. We'll have to, in a little while, talk a little bit about Old Testament priesthood because we're not as familiar as his readers are. But we're going to look at some of the problems in the text. The first problem, and all throughout the letter, is that They have external problems. The Hebrews have persecution and real suffering that require deep answers. And they're wrestling with how to find those deep answers. They have real questions. Questions like, I'm now a follower of Jesus. Can Jesus take care of me and my family when we are in real danger? Can he? How do I know that? What are the assurances that he will take care of us? I have taken a step of faith in my life. It is costing me. How do I know that Jesus will provide during that suffering? Another question, does he understand what I'm going through? He's God, right? So does he understand what it's like to be weak, to walk through this journey, to have doubts, to have real physical threats? Does he care about my suffering? He ascended into heaven. Is he just sitting around with angels playing harps, eating grapes on a cloud? Does he know what I'm going through in my circumstances? Jesus lived, but as God. So did he really suffer or was it all just, you know, a flick of the wrist, a little bit of an experience for him? Where is Jesus now and does he care about me, where he is. And what the author of Hebrews is saying to them, I understand your problems. I do. I'm walking through them myself. I'm living in the same world, wrestling these same problems. And your true problem is not your suffering and your persecution. Your true problem is you don't know Jesus well enough to ground your faith through your suffering. You don't know who it is that you're praying to. If you're asking these questions, if you're wrestling with whether or not to let go of him in order to survive, you don't really know who it is we're serving and praying to. There seems to be an obvious lack in their understanding of Jesus. And so when they need to be grounded, they have very little to be grounded in. The author makes allusions to that they haven't studied their scriptures enough. They haven't sat and meditated on them enough to see Jesus in the Old Testament, to understand how much better he is than these Old Testament stories, that they're not praying confidently and trusting that God will show up, that Jesus does care, that he is able, that his spirit is present with them. 
They are not bringing their problems to Jesus. They're pulling their problems away from him. And what we see obviously in this passage, they are not spurring each other on in that journey of discovering Jesus. They're not discipling each other. They're not wrestling with these tough questions in their community, in their church. This is where we get one of the harshest moments in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. It's actually not the harshest, but one of. About this, we have much to say. This is after what Patty had read. This is, we'll read this other passage later, but this is the author addressing. About this, we have much to say. But it's hard to explain since you have become so dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, You need someone to teach you again basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What is the author saying? They're saying, I could explain more, but I actually think you're too stupid at this point to understand. So I'm not going to go on. It'll be a waste of my time and a waste of yours for me to explain the deeper nuances because you're not even going to get it. And frankly, you should. You've been a follower of Jesus for long enough. You've sat with me and others long enough that you should be able to do this, but you can't because you're a baby. You're a big, grown baby. And you can't understand the depth of what Christ is doing. The fact that you're talking to me and asking these questions like, should I continue in faith of Jesus or should I just let him go in order to avoid suffering shows to me that you're a child. And it's hard for me to reason with a child. So I'm going to simplify it for you. It's harsh. This letter has moments that get really harsh. There's a moment where he says, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're still entering into sin, it's like you're crucifying him all over again. Ouch. He hits hard. What they're saying is, you are not learners. You may be a follower of Jesus, but you're not hungry in your following of Jesus. There's not a hunger inside of you that wants more. There's not a hunger inside of you yearning for deeper understanding. You're not longing in your prayer and longing in your study of Scripture and longing in your community to understand the depths of the beauty of who Jesus is. So when the storm comes, you have no foundation built. You haven't dug deep enough. We're watching this literally play out in Florida as a hurricane comes. And people who build their homes on sand barges and on the edge of land and don't build foundations deep and inroaded and have explored these things, the house gets washed away. The road gets washed away. What the author is saying is you haven't built those deep foundations that Jesus encourages to build your house on a rock, to build a deep foundation is painful. My sister and brother-in-law live in Swampskit, just north of Boston, and they built a deck this past year when they had someone build their deck. And Swampskit is just one big rock. The, the little peninsula is just a rock. It's literally a big granite rock that everyone built homes on. So whenever you build in Swampskit, it is a pain because you get more than 10 inches down into the dirt and it's just one big rock. It's not a series of rocks. It's one big rock. So even to put a deck into their home meant that they had to have chisels out. They had to have jackhammers out. My brother-in-law said, I was literally considering drilling holes and putting dynamite to try and blow up the rock in order to put a foundation for our deck. It is hard work to build something deep and solid. The author of Hebrews is saying, the storm's coming, you're falling apart because you haven't regularly done the hard work of digging to build the foundation. In short, the author of Hebrews is challenging us with an idea that uh, Christian Pastor A.W. Tozer coined in the 20th century when he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What we have wrestled with and who the character of God is 
how he responds to people, what his view of creation is, what his view of each of us human beings is, influences, guides, and directs how I think about myself and how I think about others. They are not engaging their problems with their faith. Or perhaps they are, and they're finding that their faith is too shallow to handle it. For many who are receiving this letter, it is clear that they saw Jesus as a helpful teacher who had given them new insights on their previous religion, and now they're asking the question, how does Jesus help me in my time of suffering? And legit, they don't know. They don't have the answer for it. In our context, it's a little different. We don't have external problems like they do. We're not under active persecution. Rome is not knocking down our doors and dragging us into coliseums. We don't have family members who are kicking us out of the family when we become Christians. Maybe some of us, but for most of us in the United States, that's not the case. We have, different from external problems, we have internal problems. And this is where the author of Hebrews can speak to us. Our suffering is not from external, it's from within. It's the deeper questions that we live in in the postmodern world of what gives my life meaning? Why do I exist? Why is any of this important or matter? Do I have value? Am I worthy of love? If I wasn't here, would anybody care? Am I worthy of anybody caring? These are the modern problems and the pressure and suffering we live under. Different, but still suffering, still hard. Many of us are going through actual external sufferings, physical sufferings with our bodies, but we have different questions. The Hebrews didn't struggle with these questions like we do. They didn't because... If they weren't a Christian and a follower of Jesus, they would just go back to being Jewish and they had answers to these questions. Does my life have value? Yes, it does. The creator God put his image in us. Do I, what's the purpose and meaning of life? Well, it's to be image bearers and to live out as the community of Israelites and to live that into. Do people care about me? Yes, because we are a people called by God. They don't struggle with these issues that we do. We spend hours at a time staring at a screen, looking at beautiful people, living beautiful lives that are literally, quite literally, fictional and unattainable. Can't. Not even my social media are any of these attainable. Not even my actual friends who I know is the image depicted in Instagram actually attainable. It's not because I know how much of a pain it is for me to post a really cool Instagram photo or an accurate story. I've had people talk to me about two things on my social media. One, they'll say to me, wow, you and Kate sure travel a lot and you have a lot of good times. And sometimes I don't go, well, actually, it's really just because I mostly just post when I'm on vacation. I don't really post at home my normal. I don't post a picture of myself eating soup that I made at lunch. I just don't do that. I post when I'm out on an adventure, on vacation, somewhere new. So my life looks like to others, wow, Brian, Kate, they just have adventure after adventure. They have so much fun. They live such a crazy life. We don't. We do it two weeks a year, and we post a lot of pictures when we do it. And then with the church, I literally have friends that say to me, like, wow, Pennington is crushing it. You guys are go you're going nuts over there. And I'm like, at first, I was like, wait, what? I was like, I mean, it's going well. Like, uh, the church is good. It's healthy. I'm, I'm grateful for where we are. But like, why, why are you saying that? And it was actually when I realized like, oh, they only know us from the Instagram account of Pennington AG Church. And Caitlin is really good at her job. And so that's all that they're seeing. And so they think like, oh my gosh, it's going so great. The negative side of what that does and what it creates are all these other pastors who are then insecure about their church or their productivity or their life or the beautiful people in their photos on their Instagram account. This is the struggle that we walk into that Hebrews can speak to us as well. How can Jesus speak into my meaning and my life and my value and who I am? Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 11 through 14 speak to, I think, us more than even the Hebrews and the intended readers. It speaks 
to us about our current struggle. In Hebrews, I mean, in Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 14, this is Moses writing to the Israelites before they enter the promised land. He says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be filled up and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Because our heart gets built up by having a lot of things. What we know is as the heart is built up by those things, those things rust and moth destroys and we're surrounded by things and eventually our heart becomes empty again. Our struggle is not against external persecution. Our struggle is against internal apathy, a struggle to care, a struggle to have urgency over life and to appreciate its beauty. My fear in America, in the Western world, is not that I may starve. My fear is that I may get diabetes or heart disease. Not that I won't eat enough, but that I may eat too much. The Bible speaks to us today and challenges those of us in the global north, those of us in the United States that are danger of eating too much, building too much, saving too much, that we may forget that we are made from the dust of the earth, but for the breath of God. And that we are made not for our individual goals, but for the communal goals of being shared image bearers across this planet with 8 billion people. And that when we have much, our call is to care for those who have less. We read a book passed down for 2,000 years about our ancestors in the faith who discovered Jesus and then were under threat of losing their life. And we read it from the comfort of a warm home in the glow of our Bible app. And we read something like Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, and we think to ourselves, well, isn't that a little harsh? Isn't that a little much? How does Jesus speak into my internal apathy? Not that we don't have access to much, but that I think we've fallen into the same trap as the intended audience of Hebrews. We haven't thought enough about Jesus. We've thought a lot about a lot. I can tell you random facts about random things across the world. Where is the deepest ocean in the world? Well, it's in Siberia, northern Russia. Where is the second deepest? Well, it's in the Baltic Sea. Why do I know this and why does this matter? We are filled with constant information and input. And the author of Hebrews would say, Jesus is greater than anything you are focusing your energy, attention, self-worth, and value on. Recenter yourself back and confidently lean into Christ Jesus. The Bible is written mostly by marginalized people who are suffering for their beliefs. But what does it say to me? when my problems are the amount of streaming apps on my TV or the fact that I'm 23 days behind on a Bible reading app, yeah, 23 days at times behind, or that it's painful to sit in 10 seconds, I mean, 10 minutes of silence and prayer. How do we fight this ongoing wave? Like the never-ending story, our enemy is the enemy of nothingness, of meaninglessness, of entertainment. So what does the author of Hebrews have for us? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 is a turning point in talking about Christ Jesus, the great high priest. The priesthood is hard for us to relate to. But in essence, what the priesthood is, is people set aside to mediate between human beings and God. God is righteous and holy and pretty scary as a result of that. The Old Testament has moments where people encounter God's presence and are immediately dead. The New Testament has some moments like that too. And so they ask God to give us mediators, and he graciously does. We call them priests. And they advocate on behalf of humanity to God, 
and then they bring God's grace to his people. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, the author gives us three things that priests do. Number one, they mediate between men and God. They mediate. Number two, they sympathize with their fellow sinners. They're humans themselves, and so when we talk to them about our spiritual problems, they sympathize with us. Yeah, mm -hmm, yep, my wife and I, yeah, same thing, Uh uh-huh, yeah, oh, your kids, mine too, Uh uh-huh, yep, the Oreos, I also, and they kind of sympathize along with that. And then third, they are called to the office. They don't just choose it. God calls them and pulls them out for this. So they mediate. They sympathize and they are called. So for a people struggling with suffering, they would naturally think, well, who can help me? Who can help us? We go to the priests. They help. I go to a priest and they sympathize and they can advocate. We're being persecuted. So I need a mediator to help me. They're Jewish and they would think, even with Jesus, I still need someone to help me with this. I still need someone to go in between for this. I still need someone to guide me. And this is where the author of Hebrews gets rolling. As Patty read, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's saying Jesus is the priest of all priests. He is the the high priest of all high priests. Like a priest, he is a mediator between God and man. Are we sinful and it's hard for us to understand the perfect beauty of our creator God and the Father? Yup. Is my mind often drifting far away from where his mind is? Absolutely. Is he oftentimes calling me to justice and care for others and be loving and gracious and I'm not really there? Certainly. Do I need someone to help me get there? A hundred percent. But they understand priests as people who do this and I have to keep coming back to the priest and it's a human so he's also weak and he has his own sins that he has to make atoning for and so almost like a church setting sometimes we say well I can go to this person but is this person trustworthy can they guide me properly what's going on in their life what the author of Hebrews says is when we come to Jesus we are coming to a priest who yes is human and did Jesus stop being human at the resurrection nope Did Jesus stop being human at the ascension? Nope. Does he stop being Jesus? I mean, being human at the resurrection one day in the future? No. He is human now and forever he will be human, which means he understands everything. He can sympathize along with us. But unlike a human being, he does not have to atone for his own sin. He's not focused or concerned about his own problems, his own mistakes, making atonement on his own, trying to make sure he's pure and having his own weakness. He is strong and righteous and holy forever, which means 100% of the work Jesus does in mediating is for you and I. He does it continually and he does it perfectly and he does it powerfully and he does it accurately and he does it compassionately and sympathetically. What the author of Hebrews is saying is don't go to another mediator and abandon the greatest mediator who ever will be in Christ Jesus, our high priest and king. He will help you in all of your ever-present needs. So press into him. I give a little picture. This is actually one of my favorite teachings to do um, when it comes to Jesus and the Bible as a whole. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the passage says this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Why is this relevant? Well, leave it up, leave it up. Why is this relevant? (laughs) The phrase, the earth was without form and void. It's one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible. It is tohu vavohu is how you say it out loud. It's spelled a little differently in Hebrew. But tohu vavohu is void and formless and void. It's a way of saying chaos. 
uncontrollable chaos. He's saying the world was uncontrollable chaos and the presence of God was hovering over that chaos to bring order to it. The Hebrews used this phrase, tohu vavohu, all throughout the Old Testament and in their life and experience. Tohu vavohu was meant to express all of the things in life we can't control. The chaos in which I have no power over. Humans can't do it. Not cattle because we were able to domesticate them. Not even lions out there because we can kill them and we've figured out the tools. For the Israelites, there were two things that were formless and void or were chaos. If you look at a picture of Israel on a map, it's a tiny little piece of land in between a vast ocean and a vast desert. And the ocean and the desert were tohu vavohu, the things we cannot control, the things we cannot contain. They are chaos. I take a tiny ship out onto the ocean. I'm in the middle of a storm. I got nothing. I don't know what to do. I take a journey out into the desert and I'm dazed into nothingness and sand. I'm Anakin Skywalker. I hate it. Sand, it gets everywhere. It's not like you. You're soft. I'm in the middle of the desert and I have no control over this place. They're the two places that any Israelite would tell you they are the embodiment of fear. We can't control them. We can't contain them. And for the Israelites, when we read the Old Testament, story after story of chaos in oceans and in deserts. Let's look at the ocean first. In Genesis 1-2, chaos waters. Those same waters flood the earth in Genesis 6 through 9. Waters destroy all life. Water is chaos and death. The waters are what Jonah is thrown into. The waters are where a giant monster lives that swallows Jonah. The waters are where sea monsters are so big that when God is lecturing Job about complaining, he says, think about these giant monsters that live in the ocean. Can you battle those things? He's making the same point that the ocean is terrifying. But it's the same waters that we see in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, the disciples are out in Tohu Vavohu. They're out in the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and there's a storm. A storm is raging, and they are saying to themselves, it's chaos, we're going to die, we can't do anything over this. And then, when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, Jesus literally just comes walking on Tohu Vavohu. He's walking on chaos. They said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus conquers the chaos of the sea. Let's look at the desert. Joshua chapter 5, verse 6 says, For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the readers of Hebrews would know this story. And in Hebrews chapter 4, he's directly making allusions to this experience, to this moment of saying, your ancestors lived in the desert and the desert took their life. They were challenged in the desert. It was chaos in the desert. And they failed that challenge. They walked through Toho Vahavohu and they couldn't conquer it. Even with Moses, even with the tablets of the Ten Commandments, they couldn't conquer it. They saw danger and they failed. Looking to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 and then 10 and 11. This is the story of Jesus' temptation in the desert. Then Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, another word for desert, to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. I'm jumping down to verse 10. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Why is this story important? when the author of Hebrews is talking about great high priests. Because 
where the priests, where the ancient Israelites, where the ancient fathers failed, Jesus begins his ministry with a demonstration that he will not fail, he will succeed. Where you have failed, he will succeed. Where we are weak, he will be strong. He will overcome every moment of tohu vavohu, every moment of chaos and fear and darkness. Jesus in the Gospels demonstrates not only his triumph over, but that he's not even afraid. He's not scared of it. He'll walk on it. He'll walk through it. He'll do it without food. He'll do it without drink. He'll do it out of his internal ability to overcome because he is the great high priest who never fails and never sins and overcomes. When the author of Hebrews says that Jesus is the great high priest who has experienced every moment of suffering that we have and yet he didn't fail, sometimes we can interpret that story like this. Well, that he didn't really suffer. If, he, if it was never the outcome that he was going to fail, then he doesn't really know what it's like to be me, to suffer through that. But the truth is, he knows far more than we ever do about suffering because he battled temptation all the way to the very edge of it and still said no. I don't know what that's like because I gave in a long time ago. He experienced the fullness of temptation because he took it to its very edge and then conquered it. So when we suffer, Christ Jesus says, yeah, I suffered, I suffered even more. Were you tempted? Yeah, I was tempted. I was tempted even more. And so for the Hebrews, the author tells them, confidently experience Jesus' victory over your external chaos. Confidently lean in and press in because he has conquered it. He can, he has, he will again. He is the great high priest who conquers all of the chaos of our world. For us today, why can we trust this great high priest in Christ Jesus? This Christ Jesus priest and king. He is conqueror of chaos, but at the same time, he's still human. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 8, and we're going to finish out here, he says, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We'll get into Melchizedek later. In the days of the flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. This is a strange passage, strange even to close out with, because people debate what this means. What does it mean that he was made a son? Wasn't he already son? What does it mean that God gave glory? Didn't he already have it? Hasn't Jesus Christ always been and always will be? So why is he given something? Why does he become something in this passage? Isn't he already become all of it? That's just who he is, right? There's such beauty in what this passage means. What it means is Jesus was already a son but he took on his calling of sonship through suffering and living among creation. The Father spoke all of this into existence through Christ Jesus. He spoke his creation into being. And the Father still loves his creation, fallen as it is. 
He loves it and he grieves along with it. And so he says to the son, when you go to earth, when you put on flesh and you live on creation, you are putting on the calling of what it means to be my son by fully embodying your own suffering along with my suffering creation. You put on the title of son by putting on the brokenness of my creation. And you receive the glory I have given to you by joining in their suffering. This is what it truly means that Christ Jesus is the great high priest. Not just that he can give perfect sacrifices and not just that he doesn't fail, but that he is the perfect sacrifice. You see, an earthly priest gives earthly sacrifices and has to keep giving them and keep giving them. And then we live this religious life where I'm always wondering, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Has the priest given enough? Have we done enough? When I, It's been a week. Maybe I should make another. It's been another Sunday. I got to come to the altar and I got to give my salvation. I gotta, I'm always worrying if it's enough. Will it stick? Is it covering? Where Christ Jesus gives himself. The high priest gives an eternal, perfect offering in his very self and very being. And he says, I will do this once and for all time so that you can rest assured that in your suffering in this world, in your doubt about who you are, do I have value? Am I worthy of love? Have I done enough? God, do you hear me in my suffering that you can always look to me as your great high priest and know, yes, I have walked this burden the way you have walked it. I have embodied it the way you are living it. And I have given once and for all forgiveness to cleanse for all time. I have given myself And so for us, we have a call to confidently experience Jesus' victory over not the external chaos alone, but over our own internal chaos. That we can give all of ourselves to Christ Jesus and trust that he will meet us and he will be enough and that he will be good. So I want to close by giving a challenge. Maybe not as harsh as the author of Hebrews because... um, I don't know. I see myself enough. Maybe they, maybe they didn't, or maybe they were better than me. I don't know. But that when we come into our areas of suffering, I don't know what yours are. I don't know if they are external, and it's something like cancer or disease and loss, or whether it's internal, and it's self-doubt and value and searching for the meaning of, of who we are. We all go through these. But that, as the author of Hebrews says, Our solution doesn't exist out there. It exists in here with Christ Jesus. And that we find our answers by confidently pressing into the presence of Jesus. There are many ways that we can do this and many ways throughout church history. For me, I have a real soft spot towards the engaging my mind in the journey. And that's why I love the midweek formations and walking through theological themes and seeing the connections and discussing them together and seeing Jesus become more beautiful as I study his word holistically. We can do this in our small group communities by grabbing a passage of scripture and together seeking the Holy Spirit to lead us to a greater truth of who God is and who Jesus is for us and in us. We can do this by pressing in in our quiet times, by making space, fighting for space in our life to have a quiet moment where we invite the Spirit of God to speak to us about Jesus and to listen. And we can do it here together. It's what Sunday mornings are for, the communal act of pressing in to Jesus Christ. I'm going to just open up this space today and just give you space. There's not much of a directive other than taking a moment of physical expression of saying to Jesus Christ, I am confidently pursuing you. I'm confidently leaning in this morning, today. And I'm encouraging you to take a physical expression of what that looks like. For many of us, that might be coming forward to the altar space 
coming up here and just saying, I'm moving out of my seat. I'm taking a step forward and picturing that in this altar space, Jesus, your spirit will meet with me. And I'll do my part of taking the step and I will trust you to do your part of meeting me. For some of us, it may be that physical posture of hands outstretched or hands upraised in this sort of surrender posture of Jesus, I'm surrendering, I'm reaching towards you in this moment. And then for some of us, it may be with the very breath of our lungs, speaking it out, prayers out loud, singing songs as loud as we can, but engaging all of who we are, confidently pressing into the person of Jesus. If you'll stand with me at this moment, if you can, I want to invite us to a prayer and then we'll move into a moment of worship. If you could just close your eyes and bow your head with me. Maybe you're in the room this morning and you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus or you're new to faith and new to this um, expression. And I want to give you a chance just to pray one prayer. The Apostle Paul tells us that if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Christ Jesus is Savior, um, he will come in, he will be our king, and we will be saved. And so I want to give you a chance just to pray that prayer, a first step of faith, a first step of longing. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can use this as a moment just to recommit together. If you'll pray with me. Jesus, in this moment, I want to meet with you. I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you as great high priest, the one who mediates, the one who advocates, the one who longs for me. Jesus, I believe that you lived on this earth. You were God and man in one flesh. You lived a perfect and righteous life. Then you gave yourself as a sacrifice for my sin. You died on the cross. You were buried, and on the third day, you rose from the grave, resurrected to eternal life, and that I may have life through you. Jesus, you suffered and gave your life for me. Jesus, I commit to whatever it may mean to give my life to follow you. I do this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. I'll invite the worship team to lead us and for us to just respond by pressing in confidently to the presence of Jesus this morning.